Hi, in this video, I'm going to show you how you can calibrate the material model to experimental data when you only have very little experimental data available. In my example today, I'm going to talk about the specific type of high trail, 8727, as shown in this graph. And there are a lot of thinking that one can actually do here to come up with a reasonable material model. And the quick answer that you may think of may not be the best one to use. So let's take a look at the experimental data first. So here is the website from Celanese. This is uh, the product information sheet for this particular kind of high trail. And there's a lot of good information here about this material, the tensile modulus, uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, etc. And at the bottom here, it has information about both the tensile modulus versus temperature and the stress strain curve. In my example today, I'm going to focus only on the stress strain curve. I will talk about uh, the, the, the dynamic response at different temperatures in a different video. That's a different topic that I want to distinguish here to make this simpler. So I'm going to talk about stress strain data at, as shown here. So how do we do this? What kind of material model can we use here if this is all that we have? So the first step is to read in the experimental data from that high trail. Uh, the website contains pairs of time and strain and stress. And you can use the data extraction uh, feature of M calibration to do that. But I'm not going to do that to save time. I already have another video that shows how you can do that. You can check out that video for, to see how you do that. So here, I already have the experimental data. Here is engineering stress, engineering strain. And it goes up and it goes to the right like this. So the, the most obvious material model to try in a case like this is a, a elastic plastic material model. We have elasticity with very large strains, 200, 300% strain. A hyperelastic material model will not be a good idea. Linear viscoelasticity won't work either because we have plasticity. An elastic plastic material model seems like the only choice in some sense because we only have one curve here. What I'm going to argue in this video is that maybe that's not the best idea. We can actually do better than that. Now, but let's still take a look at an elastic plastic material model to see how that performs. So what I will do is I will open a saved calibration I already have for that. So here's my saved file. I already calibrated this in Abacus Elastic Plastic, uh, plastic Isotropic Hardening. This works also for other finite element solvers, obviously. But if I run this once, we can see that the blue line is pretty much on top of the red curve here, showing that it's a very good fit to experimental data. But again, this data is very limited. So there is certainly some uh, simplification that goes into this material model, even though it looks perfect in this case. So let's talk about that a little bit. So if I did a load and load situation here, which we don't have data for, but I've assumed that we pull it in tension at the strain rate of 0.01, to an engineering strain of 50%, and then we unload with the same strain rate back to zero strain. Uh, the predicted stress from this particular material model will look like this. So it goes up here, rolls over, plasticity occurs, and then unloading, we have a linear elastic unloading response until we get reverse plasticity here, and then this response here. And that's very unlikely what this material will do. It will recover significantly more during unloading. And the material also will have strain rate dependence. So this material model that we have here has no rate dependence, and it, it's very poor during unloading. So uh, that, that's the main limitation here. Can we do something better, even though we don't have experimental data in this case? That's kind of the key question that I want to talk about. So the, the way you can actually address this problem, and what I think come up with a better material model, is to use an already calibrated material model or some information you have of a similar material. So I have experimental data, and I already calibrated some material models for a different kind of high trail. And that was discussed in my other video that I presented. And it's also on this website here, this web page, High Trail Modeling. And this is a different type of high trail, uh, 7246. And this is the experimental data that I have for that type of high trail. And I was able to calibrate a number of different material models to this type of high trail. And as we saw, and then we have more experimental data, the unloading predictions from the elastic plasticity is really, really bad. So I will show you now how you can use a more advanced material model and adjust that model in the proper way to this data that we have in this case. So the way you can do that depends on the material model you're selecting. I'm going to use the PolyUmod 3 network model that has a pretty good fit to all the data for this type of high trail. I'm going to now show you how you can use that for this other high trail. So here's the, 
here's the data. I'm going to save this file in a different name, and I'm going to load in this other material model. So I'm going to call it new. And then I'm going to activate the original experimental data. And then I'm going to specify my three network model. But I want to specify this from the, from, from the calibration I had from before. So I'm going to open my other calibration file. Here is previous different. And here is this material model that I had before. So if I just plot it again, this is the predictions from my previous material model uh, for a different type of high trail. I'm going to copy this material model into the clipboard by clicking on the C here. I'm going to open up my new calibration. I'm going to paste in the calibration from the other high trail. And I'm going to run once. This will clearly not fit. See, it's a pretty bad fit to the data in some sense. What, what I want to do here is to show you how you can adjust this now and calibrate this in a safe way. Because this material model is dependent on strain rate, and it has a lot of features to it that we, don't, we want to be careful when we calibrate this so we don't disturb sort of some of the parameters in the, in the inappropriate way. So the first thing I will do is I will scale this material model uh, such that it it's, uh, matches the data in a better way. And I will scale all parameters with dimension of stress by a given factor. So the factor I want to use is I'm going to click on this point here, and I'm clicking on this point here. So this is 16, and this is 32. So it's about a 50% reduction in all stresses. So I'm going to scale all variables with the dimension of stress by, by a constant of 0 0.5. So I can do that by clicking on this x0 function here. Scale the predicted stress by a constant factor, 0 0.5. OK. And uh, then if I run this again, I see that it matches the data better now. I have scaled it in a safe way. All the parameters are pretty much the same as before, except I scaled it down. Um, the next thing I can do if I, if I want to is to calibrate the model to better match this data. But I want to be careful here, because we only have data at one strain rate. And some of these parameters control how much this curve shifts with strain rate. So the best way to do that is to deactivate the parameters that control the strain rate in this list, and then I can calibrate it in a safer way. And the parameters that control the strain rate is the MM parameter. So I'm going to deactivate this MM here and this one here. So I'm going to keep them to be as strain rate dependent as the other high trail, which is an approximation. But it's better to that than to search for these because they won't be able to be any information for what they should be. So better to have these values than to pick some random numbers. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to calibrate this model from this starting point to this data. And um, I will do that in a, in a little bit of a safe way. So I, when I click Run Calibration, M Calibration will warn me, saying, you need to be a little careful here. Uh, one is P0. Maybe we'll take care of this as well. P0 says something about the pressure dependence. We want to not search for that because we don't have any information of that. So I deactivated that. And then I can I click Calibrate again. And now the, um, uh, it talks about still P0. We have another P0 here. Let's deactivate that one. And then we'll try again. And now the error warning message we get is that we should have data at different strain rates. We don't have it, but we were a little bit careful because we turned off the calibration of the MM parameters. So we can calibrate from here. It's a safe thing to do if we just take it nice and slow. And I'll do that by switching the optimization method to a simplex method. The simplex method is a method where the software will take small uh, changes to the parameters in order to improve the calibration. This is a way to make sure that parameters don't change too much too quickly. And that's a, a good approach in a case like this where we, we want to have the smallest changes to this parameter set as possible while still kind of matching this data. And that's something we can do with this uh, uh, simplex method for us. So I'm going to just let it sit here and calibrate for a few seconds, and then we'll stop and see. So it's been about two minutes. And the convergence is pretty slow, as, 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 as you can see. And I, I'm going to try to speed this up by still using the same optimization method. So one way to do that is to stop the calibration, 
start it again, accept the warning, and then when I use the simplex method, I can allow it to take more number of iterations per cycle, and that tend to be a little quicker calibration. Uh, so we'll try that again here and, and just wait a few seconds to see if this will speed up this a little bit more. All right, so it's been another minute or so. So I'm going to stop it at this point. Remember, the point here is not to try to match the experimental data perfectly, because we really have not enough experimental data for careful calibration. But we want to have a good material model because it comes with some features that are really useful for us. So it's, if we let it run a little longer, we should, we should be able to reduce this error here a little bit and reduce this error a little bit. But for my demonstration, I'm going to say this is good enough. So the error is actually a little bit worse, as you can see, than the elastic plastic material. But now we have some other advantages. Uh, and for example, if I turn on loading and unloading, this material will predict that it has a very significant uh, recovery here during unloading, as you can see. It's not just a linear elastic all the way down here. And this will be much more realistic compared to with ex real experimental data. So we will have gained a better prediction of the unloading response and the recovery after unloading. Another thing we will gain with this type of model is that we can predict different strain rates. As so if I add some virtual experiments here, you can actually take attention six strain rates, which we don't have data for, but this material model will be different in its response at different strain rate. And that is what this material should do. So yes, there's some uncertainty here in terms of what this uh, prediction really is. We don't really know the error in it, but it will certainly be more accurate in most cases, unless you have exactly this strain rate that was used in the red curve in your finite element simulation. Using is a viscoplastic material model like the TMV model that's calibrated from a good starting point for a similar material is still a doable thing to do and it tends to be more accurate in the end. So that's something I wanted to highlight in this video, that you can do this if you're careful uh, and you really don't want to change these parameters too much. And one way to do it is to use the simplex method that I showed here. If you have any questions about this, you can ask them below.